Okay, we're on the last chapter in your book, Module 16, and it starts on 135. Now, first, I want to start off with saying that this book is written for a CNA class, a Certified Nurse Assistant class. So I want you to know I'm calling this chapter Introducing Home Care, and it's a little different than home health. So the need to know words, I added some. One is a certified home health aide, a CHHA, home care aid, your client, a home health agency versus a home care agency. So, and then we'll go over resources, family care, and, and Medicare. So our objectives are really going to focus in more on the differences in home care. We've already gone over physical care and care of patients. So again, we're going to define home care, the responsibility of a home health aide versus a home care aide, because that gets confusing. Um, the, the role of a health care team versus a whole home care team and special concerns for the home, um, home maintenance and safety, and then family care. So first I want to go through um, saying the difference between a home, home health and home care. So home health is not what you'll be doing um, because home health is um, has to be medical care and prescribed by a physician, um, provided by a home health agency or hospice. You will not be able to work for a home health agency until you get your CNA and your HHHA, so your certification through the Department of Health to become a certified home health aide. Um, medical insurance for home health, medical insurance usually pays, right? And that the biggest payer Biggest insurance plan we have for 65 and older is Medicare or their private insurance, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, uh, Kaiser, um, uh, Athens, Blue Cross. There's many. Um, on the team of a home health team will be, there will be an RN as a case manager, um, and then you'll have certified home health aides. You may have occupational therapists, physical therapists, and of course, we always have the family and the patient. Um, and um, the only person that would work doing the aid providing assistance with ADLs is a certified home health aide or nurse. Um, okay, so now we're gonna compare it with home care. So home care is called non-medical and that's where you'd be able to get jobs. Um, it's provided by a home care agency versus a home health. So no health should be in the, in the name. Medical insurance will not pay. Um, the team may include an agency supervisor, so there'd be someone that you could call at the agency, you, the home care aide, and the client and their family. Now, um, home care aide provides assistance with ADLs, but they also might may do meal preparation, client's laundry, companionship, and supervision. Um, by the way, if you're looking for this information, it is not in your book. Um, so again, going from home health aid versus home care aid, if you're a certified home health aid, which you are not in this class, you'll be a home care aid, you must first be a certified nurse assistant. And um, the California Department of Public Health is the one that regulates home health aids that you will belong to registry and it has your name, address, and social security number, and you will get a life scan, right? So fingerprints. So home care aid, there's no certification needed, and your regulate, regulatory agency will be California Department of Social Services. You will be on a registry. It's not the same registry. They don't talk to each other, but they have the same information. You're gonna have your name, address, social security number, you know, phone number, things like that. And you'll also get a life scan. So just know if you go on to be a CNA, um, these two agencies, um, California Department of Public Health and California Department of so Social Services do not talk to each other, okay? And they don't share information. 
So, um, um, the California Department of Health, you may, if, so let's say you finish this class, you start to work for a home care agency and the California Department of Social Services has a life scan and all this and all your information. They will not share it if you go on to be a, a CNA with the California Department of Public Health and vice versa. Because I have people that have been CNAs and home health aides but they want to work for a home care agency because the, the work is really similar, fits more in their schedule, the pay is similar. And so they have to be on both registries, okay, and get life scans in both, both places. That being said, um, home care is very, at least your job is very similar that, than uh, to a certified home health aide. But in home care, it's non-medical. One thing you don't have to do is blood pressure, pulse, respiration, and um, they'll expect you to do temperature, but not the others. And the, but home care enables people to receive quality care in their home, right? Their comfort, their privacy. And it's always the goal to, for the client to become as healthy and independent as possible. And, it, and we wanna help the family members establish routines and carry on their normal activities. So we have to be sensitive and flexible to the needs of home care, and that includes the other people living in the home. And some of the things in home care are the same. There's legal and ethical requirements, right? Confidentiality and HIPAA laws for confidentiality. Okay, home care aides, the caregivers, do have, a, do have to follow a care plan, right? They'll have from the agency. Um, and, but the difference with you is you may go to the same house for all day long, maybe 12 hours a day. Home health aides, certified home health aides are usually just out of house at an hour and a half, enough to give a bath and get them washed up and dressed. And that's it. And they're not even there every day, just three times a week. Um, but you may be there for 12 hours a day. Um, the duties are a little different um, in that they're, besides helping with ADLs, bathing, getting dressed, brushing teeth, helping someone eat, you may do some light housekeeping, some shopping for the client, meal preparation, right? You might have to make a lunch, uh, their laundry, not the whole houses. And you might be driving them to and from appointments, medical appointments and social events. Okay, so what's different working in the home versus in a facility? First of all, you don't have other people around to help you, so that's the biggest in my opinion. But planning, prioritizing, organizing the workload. So if they expect you to do the patient's linens, you might have to change their bed so you can get the linens done, washed and dried before you leave. Um, provide, make sure the place is safe and secure. Prevent the spread of infections in the home setting. Um, you know, you, you may have to, because there's no one else around, you're gonna to have to make some good decisions. You could always call the home care agency though. Um, and be, so you'll be doing the ADLs in a home care setting, be creative, and handling those complaints and conflicts with not just the client, but the whole family. Um, you're gonna to have to adapt to the home area Right, and, and with all these jobs, physical strength and proper body mechanics is very important. We don't want you to help your, hurt yourself. Um, but additional concerns when you're working in the home as a home care aide is the home maintenance and safety, you know, is, are there rugs on the floor that need to be moved away? Um, is there spills on the floor we need to wipe up? You may do mail prep, uh, meal prep, um, and then handling those foods and storing those foods. Are they cooked enough? Are they stored right? Are they covered? Um, and then there might be some family interactions and some uh, changing needs that go around that, okay? Okay, you may have a client who has both you with the home care agency and a home health team. Um, so maybe this is a client that's been discharged from the hospital or a hospice client. Um, so you're there, you may be there eight hours a day. Let's, let's have a scenario of a 80 year old male with an 80 year old wife. The 80 year old male just got discharged from the hospital from a surgery and he can't walk around very well. Um, 
and he still needs care. So he, they may be seen by a certified home health aide, but they only come in two to three times a week to give a, a full complete shower or bed bath. Um, the nurses may come in the home in that case, but you will probably be hired for the whole day or whole shift because the 80 year old wife can't help all the time. Okay, um, so just so you know, so you're going to be working with them too. And hospices, this happens all the time with hospice because people need total care towards the end. And the team may include um, doctors, nurses, nutritionists, physical therapy, occupational therapy, social workers, speech pathologists, respiratory therapists. But you're not working with them. You're working alongside them. That's not to say you don't communicate because you're going to be talking to each other. Oh, you know, yesterday he was able to do this or he was nauseous yesterday. This is part of the team. Um, um, but you have to report any changes to your home care agency, you know, like anything other than anything that needs to be reported immediately. And then it's up to them or the family to contact the home, home health agency. But with both, the most important member of the team is the client and their family, okay? And um, just remember that the client and member involvement is vital to their care. Okay, so the team may be two different agencies, right? Home health, home care team. But good, but there's one client. So good communication skills with the team are important, as with the client and the family members. If you're afraid that you shouldn't be giving information, always give it to you know your agency. Let them decide. Report any changes in the client's mood, behavior, and health to to your agency and to the family. Um, and communicate with the healthcare team as appropriate. So when they come in and they're asking questions of, oh, um, you know, were they nauseous today and they're not, you could certainly say no, okay. Um, okay, so also at the home, now we're gonna go into what's different at home. You have to maintain a healthy and safe home. Um, with home care agencies and home health agencies should set, um, send out a supervisor to make a visit and a professional assessment to determine the needs of the client. They also should check for a home for possible safety hazards. They determine the plan of care for the home, home care aid. The care plan helps all parties understand what you're supposed to do um, and the home care aid are only assigned tasks that they have training to do. Okay, infection prevention in the home. Hand washing is still the, one of the most important ways to prevent infections from spreading. Um, um, and make sure that you protect, um, pay attention to procedures that will protect the client and family and yourself from infection. So we want to clean up after ourselves in the bathroom, but if family members aren't cleaning up after themselves, we could tell the agency because they need to contact them. Um, and we also have to be aware of common household um, items that could spread infection like sponges, dishcloths, eating utensils, soiled laundry, because you might be making meals. So you have to make sure that the kitchen is clean, the dishcloths are clean, we could wipe the doorknobs with the Lysol wipes, make sure tissues are thrown into the, into the waste basket, you know, the garbage can, and definitely ask clients and family to cover their nose when they're sneezing, have them wear a mask, whatever we are with COVID on that protocol. Then wash your hands are the same, except it's also before meal prep because we might be doing meal prep, right? So before and after, um, contact with a client, eating or meal prep, which is an on their bathroom, garbage can before and after, after the using the bathroom, the garbage can, or sneezing. And wear gloves at all time when handling blood, body fluids, or sharps like razors or other sharp objects. Okay, um, the liquid, um, liquid waste. So if they have diarrhea, urine, make sure that it, you go from room to room with a covered container. And in the commodes, they should be covered. They have a top, um, pour it in the toilet, and then close the lid and flush. Um, 
for solid waste, we're going to put those in heavy plastic bags. And if they don't have bags, you need to call the agency. And we are to take out the trash. Um, soiled linens, um, we remove them from the bed. And we're going to launder things in the hottest water that it says we can on the uh, instructions and, and a detergent. Um, and if it's heavily soiled, you may have to um, either clean it separately with gloved hands um, and or it may have to be disposed of. Now, we're not supposed to do heavy cleaning. However, you need to keep the home healthy by making sure it's clean the areas you use. So the bathroom especially. And so hopefully they have some different disinfectant, and I'll call your agency, to wipe down the the walls, you know, in the shower or the floors, the countertops, the toilets, the tubs, the sinks um, with a disinfectant. Floors should be clean and dry using non-skid rugs. Um, encourage the family to hang up the wet towels and remind the family that they have to clean up after themselves. Now, if that's happening, you need to call the agency, let them remind them. Because there might be children or you have a dementia patient, the cleaning product, product product should be in a safe place, hopefully locked or up high if it's just children. Never mix products together, so always read the instructions. Um, always wear disposable gloves when handing those, chem those cleaning agents. And wash your hands before and after all household chores, even if you're wearing the gloves. So again, it's your responsibility for maintaining the safety of the client's immediate living area, like in their bedroom. Um, and be aware of safety hazards that may be in the house, like uneven floors. When you're going in the house for the first time, you should have some basic guidelines, right? An emergent, where are the emergency exits and an alternate plan, like if there's a fire and emergency, so are the windows you could get out, back doors you could get out. Um, there should be adequate lighting throughout the house. Now, you can't change that, but you could call the agency. Um, the agency should make sure they're smoked it detectors, um, but you could make sure too. And if they're used space heaters, make sure that they're not near anything that can burn. They start, they can start fires and they could burn the client because they get really hot in one area um, if they're close enough to the client. Um, other things, make sure electrical outlets aren't, cords aren't frayed. If they are, don't use them. Uh, make sure electrical appliances are unplugged when they're not in use, like the coffee pot. Keep medications labeled and stored securely. So all medications should be labeled. You're not giving it to them, but don't let them take something if there's no label or not in a medi medication pack that the nurse has made. And then if they need handrails in the bath or the shower, it's not up to us to do it, but we could tell the agency so they could tell them and maybe recommend someone who can do that. So kitchen safety, um, basic, guide, basic guidelines are turn off. That should be off when the stove is not in use. Uh, never wear long, loose sleeves, right? Um, and you should probably be wearing scrubs anyway, but they could get burn if there's big sleeves. Turn the handles of the pots inward towards the back of the stove. So if you're walking by, you don't knock it over or the patient doesn't knock it over. If you're cooking something and it's on high heat, you know, not like a crock pot on a low heat, but a high heat, you need to stay in that area. Wipe up spills on the floor immediately. And if there's dishes that are chipped or cracked, don't use them. Okay, for food handling, we have to wash our hands before we use gloves. Um, if you have any cuts, you should be wearing um, um, uh, gloves anyway um, with those. Um, prepare the food in a clean kitchen. So you might want to wipe it down before you start unless you're sure it's clean and use clean kitchen utensils. So you might have to wash those again if you don't know if they're clean. Wash the vegetables and fruits well. Um, be sure that all the meat is thoroughly cooked. So there are guidelines on most meat thermometers to see if they're cooked. Um, and you could ask the agency to ask them to get a meat thermometer. Um, cover and refrigerate leftovers promptly, right? So um, if the food is warm, put it in the, in the refrigerator before it cools. So if you're shopping for the family, make sure you buy the amount of food that can be stored proper, properly. So 
you know, unfortunately, fruits and vegetables go bad and their refrigerator, refrigerator might not be big enough for, you know, everything. So make sure that you, you don't buy too much at once. Check the refrigerator for the temp correct temperature. Cover all dry foods such as flour and sugar um, because, the, you know, uh, uh, if, if it could get infestations of bugs throughout foods that are past the ex expiration date, so you should be looking at that. Keep the storage areas clean and dry and check the food storage. So if there's insects or rodents, we need to tell the agency. So in your book on page 140 and 141, they go over physical needs and I'm gonna kind of jump through the ones that we, how it's different in the home. So one thing is we could regulate the temperature of the home, right? But, um, and just to know that elderlies are at higher risk um, during cold or hot temperatures, really, um, because they, they can't thermo insulate themselves. So some people try to, in the winter, save on um, money. So they might not set their thermostats up high enough. And just know if they don't have this sdg and &E down here, gives reduced cost for elderly and those with medical needs, and they don't go advertising it. So, and generally, even if they're just old, their physician, even if it's home care, non-medical, you could ask the family, the physician could sign something saying that they either need a warm house and or air conditioning in the summer. So it, it brings down the cost. It's not free, but it'll bring down the cost. And that being said, um, you know, make sure you layer the, the clothes in, in, the, in, the, in the winter so they stay warmer. We may be getting people dressed and undressed, and this is where we could um, ask the families to get different kind of clothes, you know, sweatpants that stretch, Velcros instead of zip, zippers. To, so when we assist them, it's easier and they could be more independent. Okay, be, because we're in the home, we don't want them to fall, and they may not have railings, and they may came home without assisted device, and you think a wheelchair, or a wheel, not a wheelchair, but maybe a walker is better for them. You know what? Advocate for that patient. They will have a doctor and advocate through your agency. You know, you could talk to the family, um, but we need to advocate through them. Um, always follow your care plan, though. And, and then one thing to prevent people from falling is clients, when they sit up fast, they may um, get dizzy. So always have them sit for a while. Take a few deep breaths. Smell the roses. Blow out the candles. Smell the roses blow out the candles, gives them time for them to get oxygenated and get their blood pressure regulated. Okay, so I jumped over to medications. So, home, um, uh, and it's on page 141 in your book, home care aid does not dispense medications. What they can do is do medication reminders, they call it, remind the patient to take their medicine. They could assist with opening the dispensers, getting them a cup of water, they do need to document the patient took them up or did not take them. And of course, we need to report it if the client refuses medications, even for home care agencies, just so everybody knows what's going on. Um, or if they took too much or the wrong things. Um, and, and, and also, we're going to look for side effects, too. Do they have diarrhea, nausea, nausea, vomiting, headache? Anything could be a side effect, confusion, dizziness. Okay, besides labeling the medications properly and storing them where kids can't get them or confused patient cannot get them, um, note if, there, if some need to be refrigerated, so you might have to store them in the refrigerate, refrigerator, um, and some need to be on, taken on empty stomach and others need to be taken with food. That's, this is how we could help them. And, and again, keep all the medications safe and away from kids. So again, if a patient's on oxygen, we're not going to set it. That has to be the patient or the family. And we never have burning candles or gas heaters near the oxygen. And there should be, and this, you should be doing, no, no smoking signs. So if they have visitors, they know that. Um, and then the storage should be in a cool place. But um, And again, if they're not in a cool, secure place, then you need to call the agency. So diet, diet and hydration is, is a large role in protecting and maintaining this client's health. And the elderly don't get thirsty. They may not be hungry. They may skip meals when you're not there. 
And also, um, it's a time to socialize. So if you could sit with the client while they're eating um, and make sure that they're fed and have maybe small meals in between, um, that would be great. Be flexible with their eating patterns, though. Okay, just because a person is old doesn't mean that they should have mood changes or forgetfulness. So you have to document and report any of these things that are differences, right? Um, and if, if patients are declining where they're forgetting day-to-day -day information because of maybe medications or um, whatever their diagnosis is, that we could use calendars and post reminders. Part of that is they don't get out of the house and everything just like during COVID kind of goes together. You know, for us that never got out of the house during COVID, you know, it, it, our day-to-days were often the same. So you need, you're there to also uh, relay this, met, this information if there's behavior changes, okay? Um, and if the client is irritable, it could be a sign of depression. Um, we could have them talk about their feelings, how, and we could suggest hobbies and encourage family members to participate in activities or visit. Um, however, we still need to report all those things, right? Um, so, because they may need some anti-depression medicine. And any talk of suicide takes seriously because um, that is often, they'll go through with that. A part of bringing a home care aid in is to, to get the family out of crisis. So maybe this pay, the two uh, elderly were living together. Now the patient fell, had hip surgery, and they're now out of rehab, but they can't take care of themselves. So you're in, so that's a crisis mode. You're in there to help bring a little routine and order to this family. Take the burden off the spouse or the significant other with them. Or if they live alone, they don't have the independence anymore. Um, always listen to their concerns, but don't take sides in the family. Treat each family member as an individual. Um, and one way to listen is to say, oh, I hear you're saying that you're really upset, or I hear you're saying you're not getting any sleep, to, to repeat what they said to you. That validates that you actually listened. Um, and um, we're going to work towards the patient themselves being independent and the family being independent. So they may be learning how you're doing things, too. Um, so, but if there's weird things going on, like you're afraid of drug abuse, violence, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, we need to report that to our supervisors. Um, and just know that people will go through different stages. So you don't need to know this, but there's at this point, Erickson's stages of life and through different areas of life, um, people learn different things. And they say the elderly, because that's who we're going to take care of, have wisdom. However, the, however look, look at this, and the way they write, write it is a little weird, but I'm down at the bottom. A sense of integrity strong enough to withstand physical disintegration. As our body breaks down, do we have the integrity to just kind of live with it and cope with these new things? Um, okay. You might be called in for childcare, um, or you might be called in because a parent is sick, and so, but the child is still there. So we have to figure out the, um, have to have a sense of normal for the ch children's routine, um, and you'll have to find out who your patient is. Is it the, is it the parent or is it the child? So don't be afraid to ask that. Assure. Um, the child that you're there to help, because maybe you're helping the mom, but you're not really there for them. Maybe they're 13, right? They could take care of themselves, and that that parent who needs physical help could still tell them what to do. Um, and I just know that change is stressful. With most children, um, especially younger, their way of reacting to uh, stress is um, is fear, and that they often regress, right? But there's so here's some of these emotional responses are withdrawal, um, aggression, anger, anxiety, sadness, depression, hopefulness, and um, other things are regression. So this is maybe they're afraid of the dark if they're younger, you know, or they start bedwetting even though they've been toilet trained. 
they're throwing temper tantrums, right? Or whining, clinging. Um, um, so try to help the children with these difficult times. So just think they're a brat because they're doing those things. That's just their way of coping and calm their fears by listening, you know, maybe to the concerns. Okay, there's a lot of resources um, that are out there and we may help the family through the internet, through your phone, help, help, help look for those things so they could get out. Um, the big one that we'll have is San Diego County Aging and Independent Services. They have a lot of resources on their website. Um, but other places, you know, the newspaper, the news, the internet. And here's some examples of different ones, right? Um, there's crisis hotline, there's food banks, there's, ho there's hospices, um, local support groups. Here's national organizations. They're in your book and they're on this PowerPoint. And that is the end of the uh, home care and chapter 16. Yay!